oh my God, the land that I own, uh, this land used to have a theater on it and no longer does. What the F happened? Oh, Mark. I'm good. Hello. My name's Mark Gagliardi, and today we're gonna talk about William Shakespeare and the great theater heist of 1598. <laughs> <laughs> oh, f All right, let me set the stage for you. It's the late 16th century in a neighborhood just north of London called Shoreditch, where the most brilliant minds of the time have started gathering at the taverns. You've got uh, Sir Walter Raleigh and um, Christopher Marlowe, who's like the biggest playwright in the world. And it was there that James Burbage makes this land deal with Giles Allen and decides to build his own theater. It is called The Theater, with an R-E, not an E-R. You do it with an R-E because it's classier. Yeah. Um, so William Shakespeare shows up. I'm William Shakespeare. I'm the new guy. Um, so in, in uh, so then he spends the late 1580s uh, writing and <laughs> starring in some of his early works. But in 1594, the theater scene was viciously crippled by a bubonic plague outbreak. So James Burbage, founder of the theater, has decided, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get together a troupe of actors made of all of the actors whose troops had disbanded during the bubonic plague and create a super group of Elizabethan actors called the Lord Chamberlain's Men. Would you like water? I'll take that as a no. So, Shakespeare's found his home, mm -hmm. and his home is the theater. And at this time, Shakespeare is prolific. He's writing some of his best plays. He's churning out, he's like, oh, hey, here, try this one out. This one's called Hamlet. Here, try this one out. I call this one Othello. You're probably gonna need some shoe polish to play Othello, but nobody's socially conscious enough that blackface isn't a bad thing at this point. So Shakespeare has these guys doing these amazing plays until 1597. Giles Allen says, oh, you wanna renew the lease? Hang on a second. I've decided these plays are bullshit. I hate the theater. And James Burbage is like, wait, what? So Giles Allen, Giles Allen, Giles Allen, Giles Allen says, I'm a Puritan, so I think that plays are dumb. Even though you're doing Shakespeare and your plays are gonna be read by school kids in 2015 because they're that GD important. Theater is like, you know, of the devil. So, sorry. And James Burbage was so distraught by this that he died of a broken heart. And Giles Allen said, James Burbage is dead. This is my land. I'm going to do what I want with it. But one of the Lord Chamberlain's men went, hey, fellas, hang on a second. I've been looking at the lease, the like actual piece of paper that our lease is written on. And that lease says, Giles Allen owns the land, but technically speaking, we own the building. What are we gonna do about this? So then, boh, hold on. So on the night of December 28th, 1598, it happened that Puritan landowner Giles Allen was out of town for the Christmas holiday. The Lord Chamberlain's men decided to take matters into their own hands. William Shakespeare and the members of the Lord Chamberlain's men are like, you know what? This building belongs to us. 
and we are going to take it. They went into the costume storage rooms. They put on their most terrifying military battle gear, and they proceeded to take down the entire building, including the 30-foot beams that held the building aloft, brick by brick, every last piece. I got you. What are we talking about? Um, Alexander Hamilton. How dare you? So, uh, Giles Allen came back. He realized that, oh my God, the land that I own, uh, this land used to have a theater on it and no longer does. What the F happened? I'm gonna try to bring you back up. So Shakespeare and the Lord Admiral, <laughs> Lord Chamberlain's men, they took down a whole building and they took all of those pieces across the Thames and board by board, they rebuilt this theater, rechristened at the Globe. And this is where Shakespeare premiered his greatest works. And hey, did you learn Hamlet in high school? It's because Shakespeare and his buddies stole a theater. Hello, my name is Jimmy O. Yang, and today we're going to talk about the kidnapping of Lincoln's body. Mm. <laughs> it makes you thirsty, huh? <laughs> so our story began in 19, oh wait, 1875 uh, in Chicago. This dude. Big Jim Keneally had like the best counterfeiting rank in Chicago. But the real man behind the scene was this guy named Boyd. He was the guy that made the best press and his fake bills are so good. People would look at him and be like, yeah, it looks like real money to me, but it's not. <laughs> so, so they were making so much money that the Fed finally caught up with them. And then Boyd took the heat and he went to jail. And now Big Jim is like, shit. I just lost my guy. I don't have my cash full anymore. What can I do about this? So he went to the saloon that he owned called The Hub, and he talked to a couple of his goons called Mullen and Hughes. And he's like, guys, we're gonna go kidnap Abraham Lincoln's dead ass body. Wow. And we're gonna hold it for ransom for Boyd's release from prison? And 200 grand, boom. And then his buddies mulling and he was like, Big Jim, at it again with the great ideas. And in that midst of that conversation, this other guy named Louis Sweagles came up to him and was like, hey guys, you guys talking about stealing Lincoln's body? Cause um, I don't mean to brag, but I am the boss of body snatching. So then Mullen and Hughes was like, whoa, <laughs> Sweagles? You seem like a legit guy. Come on in in our crew. So now Hughes, Mullen, and Sweagles are now in the kidnapping crew of Lincoln's dead body. But little did Hughes and Mullen know that Sweagles was actually an informant for the new agency called the Secret Service. So he went back to the head of the Secret Service agency, Patrick Tyrell, who is from a Tyrell family of Game of Thrones, Do you ever go outside? Not really. Okay. Mostly video games and Game of Thrones. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So Sweagles, he's like, yo, Pat, I got a scoop for you. These guys are playing to kill your dead president. Well, you can't kill them. I'm sorry. These guys are plotting to kidnap your dead president. <laughs> you should go catch their ass red-handed. So Patrick Tyrell, he was super down with this. He was like, yes, this is it. If we can protect the dead president, that means we can protect the live president. This is the publicity we need to cement ourselves as the goddamn secret service of the United States of America. So Hughes, Mullen, and Sweagles went to the grave that night. And the secret service guys, they all camped out around the graveyard to try to catch these guys red-handed. And then when the three guys got to Lincoln's grave, they're like, whoa, 
I guess this is how like rich people bury themselves. It's a mausoleum, a sarcophagus, and then a coffin. Like shit, what should we do? So Mullen took out his ax and he was like, I'm just gonna bash this shit and take Lincoln's body. And then Sweagles, obviously he didn't want to damage Lincoln's body. He was like, whoa, whoa guys. You can't, you can't do that, dude. You know, that's gonna alert uh, the graveyard owner and we'll have less time to run. And then Mullen was like, you know what? You're right. We're gonna do this slightly more, what's the word, like sophisticated? Slightly more? Sophisticated. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you're right. We're gonna do this with a little more finesse. So then Mullins picked the padlock, right? And then it got in the grave, they're like, okay, let's uh, try to lift it, and then we just take the whole thing. And then they realized they're all too weak to lift the sarcophagus. So they're like, shit, we really were unprepared. So Suigo was like, ah, you know what, boys, you know, I'm just gonna go outside, smoke a cigarette, and think about this. Is somebody having sex next to us? Uh, it's definitely an animal. I don't think it's sex. It's I an think animal? it's a coyote or a dog. That's a sexy ass coyote. <laughs> so Swiggles used this opportunity to signal Patrick Tyrell and the Secret Service guys. So they all like tippy toed in there. But then this guy, George Hay, was so stoked and nervous, he fired his firearm on accident. Whoops. And everybody freaked out. So Hughes and Mullen was like, shit, we gotta get out of here. And all the Secret Service agents start like firing in the dark. They're like, boom, man, this is bullshit, dog. So by the time they got to the mausoleum, Mullins and Hughes has gotten away. So it was a huge mess. And then the Secret Service guys are like, ah, oh, shit, we really f this one up. So Hughes and Mullins, they didn't know it was the Secret Service. They just thought it was some random dude's shootout at a graveyard. So they just went back to the hub and they just chilling. And then the Secret Service can bust into the bar and catch up with them. So they're all patting each other's back. They're like, we finally got these assholes, you know? This is the establishment or the Secret Service. We're gonna protect presidents dead or alive for now to eternity. So in the end, to quote my grandfather, Up, up, down, down, B, A, B, A, select, start. C, senor. Hi, my name is Mark Gagliardi, and today we're going to talk about the theft of the Mona Lisa. It's a painting. Hmm. It's 1911. Paris is the center of the universe. But at this moment in time, the Mona Lisa was not actually a terribly famous painting. It's just one of the paintings that's hanging in the Louvre. And the French are like, yeah, it's a painting in the Louvre. Like, it kind of looks like my aunt, but you know, I don't think it's all that important. <laughs> and uh, at this point, Vincenzo Perugia, an Italian immigrant, got a job as a glassmaker in the Louvre. And he's like, oh, look at this, all of these beautiful paintings in the Louvre. But the French are like, oh, you're, you know, a dirtbag from Italy who's come in to steal our jobs. So clean the floors, macaroni. And that's the world that Perugia was brought into. And he would think to himself, why are these French calling me macaroni when this great piece of Renaissance art came from my homeland and was stolen by Napoleon? You know what? F these assholes. Leonardo da Vinci worked out of Florence. He painted this plate. He painted this painting of Lisa de Gioconda in Florence. This is our painting, and I'm bringing it back to my people. I'm I'm beyond drunk, by the way. F Y information. <laughs> so on August twentieth, nineteen eleven. Vincenzo Perugia went to the Louvre and he hid in a closet until Monday, the day that the Louvre is closed for cleaning. So he comes out and he walks up to the Mona Lisa. He puts it under his smock and, well, he steals it and he leaves the Louvre 
walks home to his one-room apartment and places the Mona Lisa on his breakfast table. So, Tuesday, August 22nd, the Louvre realizes Mona Lisa, La Gioconda, has been stolen from the Louvre. <gasps> and every newspaper in the world printed any picture they could that was like, here's what the Mona Lisa looks like. Little kids are selling newspapers for a penny a pape going, oh, this is some Ocean's Eleven shit right here. So this picture of Mona Lisa is being spread throughout every continent in the world. And everybody was going, oh my God, what a beautiful work of art this woman is. Uh, Rude. I feel like the magic has been taken out of my soul and put on to display. Well, that's what happens when you do television. So, Louis Lapine, the head of the French police, brings in Perugia for an interrogation, and Lapine's like, what'd you do? What'd you do with the loot? And Perugia's like, uh, why am I here? What's all this all about? And Lapine's like, uh, the Mona Lisa has been stolen. Why aren't you listening? And Perugia's like, the Mona Lisa was stolen? And Lapine's like, this guy's an idiot, man. There's no way he did it. So for the next two years, every morning, Vincenzo Perugia would look at this masterpiece and he would say, <sighs> I've looked at a lot of paintings, but until I looked at the Mona Lisa, no painting ever looked at me. And the, that smile on Mona Lisa's face is saying, I acknowledge you, I know what you're going through, and it's okay. Everything's okay. Yeah, I need another one of these. So after two years, Perugia reaches out to Alfredo Gheri, who is an Italian art dealer. And he goes, I have something that you might be interested in. It's the Mona Lisa. I'm going to give you the picture and I'm going to get some money. So Alfredo Gheri, why don't you call me on the telephone? Now is it true if he found a mushroom, you would become a little bigger? <laughs> you don't like my accent, is that it? <laughs> okay. So Alfredo Gary reaches out to the Italian authorities and he's like, hey, uh, you are looking for the guy that has stolen the Mona Lisa. So uh, here is the number. So the Italian authorities are like, oh, hey, you're Perugia? You're under arrest. And he's taken before the Italian court. And he says, this painting, La Gioconda, the Mona Lisa, was stolen from Italy by Napoleon and it was my task to take this painting out of the Louvre and bring it back to the Italian people who deserve it. I have nothing to be ashamed of as an Italian. And after his impassioned speech, the Italian judge said, actually, this painting wasn't stolen by Napoleon. Leonardo da Vinci came to France and actually gave this painting to the King of France as a gift. So you really don't have a leg to stand on. But you know what? We're super into your patriotism. You're super good at being Italian. So how about this? We give you a sentence of seven months, which is what you have already been in prison, and we release you today. And Perugia was like, I really like you guys. Thanks, man. Vincenzo Perugia was an inconsequential house painter from Italy. And by stealing the Mona Lisa, he made that work of art, the most famous painting in all the world. Oh, the hell, dude. Hmm? What are we doing, a fucking very special blossom here? <laughs> Hello, I'm, my name's Brendan Walsh, and today we're going to be talking about the Santa Bandits. Our story starts in 1927, in the days leading up to Christmas. Marshall Ratliff got out of jail, and he's like, I'm out of jail, time to rob another bank. But I need help, so I'm gonna get 
uh, this guy Ed Helms. Oh, I'm from The Hangover. <laughs> He's, uh, this guy, Henry Helms? I'm gonna get Henry Helms and Robert Hill, and they rope in Helms' brother-in-law, Louis Davis. And Ratliff says, help us rob this bank in Cisco. And uh, Ratliff's afraid he's going to get recognized. He goes, I want to disguise myself. Hey, it's Christmas. So they steal this Buick, and they arrive in Cisco on the morning of December 23rd. Uh, Ratliff gets out of the car. He's dressed as Santa and gets mobbed by kids. You see Santa, kids are going to come towards you. Kids yeah? want to see you. You're like just, you're like the Justin Bieber of the times. Yeah. And he's a bank robber, but he's like, yeah, okay, I gotta go. Santa's gotta make a deposit, kids. So after that, he, he goes into the bank, and he doesn't even say anything. And uh, the tellers are like, Santa's here. And then Hill, Helms, Davis all bust in with their guns a blazing. They go, hey, all right, everybody shut up. We're robbing this place. Santa Ratliff gets $12,400 in cash and $150,000 in bonds. Santa's like, yeah! But this lady, Mrs. Blessing Game, goes into the bank and fing loses her shit. She's like, ah! <laughs> so she uh, runs out screaming her head off. <laughs> I love that Duncan Trussell is this woman. Hey, Terrence McKenna predicted this bank was gonna be robbed, man. <laughs> <laughs> so then the whole town, they hear her running up and down the street. And at this time, the Texas Bank Association was like, well, we're offering $5,000 for anybody who shoots a bank robber doing a bank robbery. And the whole town is like, we could use $5,000. That's a lot of money back now. So everybody grab their guns, because an angry mom's about to, angry mom's about to form. <laughs> Uh, so um, they go into the bank while all the the robberies go on, and then it just everybody just starts shooting. <laughs> Customers are getting shot. A guy gets shot in the leg. So the Santa bandits, they're like, "Why well, everybody's shooting us? Get into the alley!" Because that's where the Buick is. But everybody keeps shooting. The bandit gets shot. Uh, the bank president gets shot. Everybody's going nuts. All right, so. The, the Santa bandits, they grab these two young girls as human shields to get into their Buick and get the f out of there. So Santa's driving the car and he looks at the gas gauge and he goes, what the, f we're f***ing almost out of gas. What a bunch of idiots. And they're like, we drove 100 miles from Wichita Falls and we didn't get gas in 1927. So <laughs> they see this Oldsmobile and they're like, give us your Oldsmobile. And he leaves. Helms gets shot. They're like, come on, put all the money in here and get Davis in there. And they get in the Oldsmobile and then they realize uh, the keys. So they're like, well, well we can't do anything to this. So then they like get back into the Buick and they leave Davis there. Poor Seth. He's and they're like, well, that sucks. And they're like, oh, shit. We left the money in that car, too, in the old movie. And they're like, uh, uh, what's it mean when you're swallowing too much? Good question. <laughs> so they're trying to cross the Brazos River, but they get ambushed. And they uh, shoot Radliff six times. So Helms and Hill just give themselves up, and Ratliff survives. So the townsfolk are out there. They're like, we've had it with this guy. And they put a noose around his neck. They're like, we're going to publicly lynch you because we've had it with your shit. And he's just like, hey, I got an idea. Forgive me. And then they're like, all right, no, no. And then they fucking hang him. And well, yeah, then he's croaked. These guys fucked up. Because back then, it was uh, so easy to get away with crimes. They were stupid. 
<laughs> so the day was. Aaron will tell the story. Yeah, I'm good at that part, Michael. Um, so the are day you guys was, married? Yes, we, we are. are. Three years. No one could tell. So at the um, Isabel the Isabe Gardner. Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Museum. A, a okay. few blocks away from where we are right now. Yeah. Isabel's a very eccentric woman. She was sort of like, I'm gonna wear a headband when no women wear headbands. And she thought that life, I'm going to do something awesome. And so she built this museum. I mean, she had like thousands of pieces of art that were from like these most expensive like places of, of world. So do you want me to go to 1990? Yes. The story proceeds that uh, there was two gentlemen um, that were dressed as police officers that went to the building of Isabel Stewart. They rang the, they rang the doorbell and they said, um, there is a disturbance of teenagers we heard around the building. We just want to make sure that everything's okay. The security guard said, well, I'm not really supposed to allow anyone in, but I will like allow this because you're police officers, which is insane. And he said, Mr. Blah, 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 there's a warrant out for your arrest. You're under arrest for the blah, 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 blah. And he was like so that he was like, OK, like, something's happening. So I got to like kind of say, hey, what's going on? So he moved. And as soon as he moved, they boom, 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 tackled him. What was so crazy was, OK, they like called the other guy on security. They had him call on security and say, you, you need to come down here, something's happening. Like, So this guy came in. So they taped him up, blah, 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 duct taped their mouse. They realized that Isabel was so smart in her time that she like literally like secured the art to the wall. Get, they couldn't panicked. Get, couldn't they get the panicked. frames off, they so panicked. they needed to oh, we gotta get out of there. So what was even crazier was they took a knife and just went like, F you, like oh. boom, 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 crazy, you know? Like they were just like, F it. They were like idiots, they cut it out. And we're like, boom, let's roll it out and sell it on like Canal Street, New York. Like they took out razor blade? Yeah, so cut like, like, mean, he, like thug like nation. So these guys go through, well, they things. steal a... like hundreds and millions of dollars worth of art. So this FBI guy came in and people were reported these guys were like around 35 years old, like 5, 10, like they, these policemen that got in this car, it's insane. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's crazy that. And he's like, I've seen Rembrandts appear at these Chinese restaurants in the bathroom before, or I've been in Paris where I've been in this underground tunnel and there's been a picture of Monet. So what was even crazier was every lead was dead, 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 dead. And he was just like, I have never experienced something like this. I have never like ever in my life not been able to follow up because he used to be, he worked for the FBI. He worked in the art theft situation. The art has never resurfaced, ever in its time. And which is so rare that like- 22 years with a $5 million reward. Somebody somewhere in some Southie place is holding that Rembrandt up in some frame somewhere. And that's what's happening. They were either idiots, they were con men, they were just stupid, or they were brilliant, but they never made it to the fourth floor because that's where all the expensive art was.